Um, as Hazel said, many people are familiar with the Nadir objects, but perhaps are not so familiar with the person behind them. So in this short talk I want to talk about Messier the man. Cataloguer, and in many cases discoverer, of some of the most stunning objects in the night sky. Messier was born in a town in uh, eastern France called Baudeville, near the French-German border. Um, at the time that Messier lived there, it was an independent dukedom. In fact, this part of France has sort of changed allegiance many, many times over the centuries. It's now actually part of, of Alsace-Lorraine. But the, the town of Bardeville is basically um, between Nancy and Strasbourg and a, bit, and a bit south, so it's there. Messier was born on 26th of June 1730, the 10th child of 11 children, and his father was the court bailiff um, of Senes. They were a wealthy family, um, essentially his father was the, was the chief financial person for this dukedom, and therefore they had excellent connections, connections which Messier relied upon later on in life. This is a town in the, the western Vosges mountains, and it's, this is a photograph I took last year. It's a slightly depressing town now. You get the impression it's seen better days. Um, it was a big area for the production of porcelain, and there's still a very nice porcelain museum in the town, but the rest of it is, just gives you a feel it sort of um, had its day. But um, by contrast, a few miles away in a village in Alsace, you've got houses and villages that look like this. Clearly there's a lot more money in wine than there is in porcelain. <laughs> this is Messier's birthplace. Um, this is his house there. Um, it's quite a large house. Um, goes around the corner there. It faces northeast, and one can well imagine the young Messier standing on the balcony there and, uh, and observing the night sky. The square, he's actually got a square named after him. And he's got a fine plaque up on the wall that uh, tells you that he was uh, an astronomer, he was a marine astronomer, he was a member of the Bureau of Longitudes, he was a member of the Academy of Scientists, uh, Sciences, etc. So this town are very proud of Messier, um, and they're much prouder of him than I think Paris is, or Paris was. One slight note there, they've got his death down as the 12th of April. Many references given as the 11th of April, so I don't actually know which is correct without doing some more research. I did search through the, uh, the cemetery looking for Messier graves. There are a couple, um, but they're all later family members. I had a discussion in the bar, in the local bar, with, with a lady, and she said that Messier family did live in the village or in the town until the 1950s, and then they all disappeared and went to America. So there appears to be no Messier there now. Now, because this area of France was fought over heavily during the war, there are military cemeteries everywhere, there's a big one in Bardenville, um, and also there are many plaques like this on the wall. Um, documenting the various atrocities that took place. So it's, it's a slightly sad area in many ways. Also, just down the road, you have the, the chateau of uh, Königsberg. Uh, a fantastic chateau uh, perched on the top of a hill, great big massive building, and it is the building or the chateau from which the Kaiser intended to rule Europe and possibly the war if after the First World War. And uh, there he is in his finery, and, and I do think what a superb hat he's got on there, isn't, isn't that? Isn't that? Perhaps the BAA president should have one like that, but with a telescope <laughs> on the top rather than an eagle. I don't know. But it's good to see that some medieval stonemasons had a sense of humour. <laughs> so, what got Messier interested in astronomy? Well, we can only guess at that, but uh, at age 13, uh, Chizzo's comet was around, um, and if he had seen it like that, or certainly if I'd seen that as a 13-year-old, I would certainly have wanted to do astronomy. Whether it really did look like that, we don't know, but the size and the number of tails seem to get better in the telling. But it was clearly uh, a very, very bright object. It was said to be an easy, naked eye object in the daytime, um, and it's said to have reached magnitude minus 7. So I guess that was one thing that certainly uh, influenced 
first him. And another thing possibly was an annual solar eclipse um, when he was 17. Now it wouldn't have been annual from where he was, uh, he was he was there, but this this um, image here shows you the sort of eclipse he would have seen. Uh, quite a, a, a nice partial eclipse at a convenient time of the morning. Uh, in fact, it looks very like the eclipse from my village in Essex would have looked last week if I'd actually been able to see it. <laughs> so hopefully, um, mostly I had better better weather than I did. As I just said, he was the tenth of twelve children. Um, and of course, as was often the case in those days, six of them died uh, when they were young. And perhaps sadder, his father died when um, Charles was only aged eleven. But his brother, Hyacinth, came to the fore. Hyacinth had already, in fact, I must say, if, I, if I'd had a brother called Hyacinth, I would have kept quiet about it. But, um, <coughs> but Hyacinth and Charles got on very well together. And in fact, the previous year, before, before his father died, Hyacinth had effectively taken over um, financial affairs of the dukedom. So he was quite wealthy and he was able to, to support the family. But in 1751, the dukedom of Psalm lost its independence and it became part of Lorraine. And later it's become part of France. As I said, it was changed, seemed to change allegiance many, many times. So effectively it was all changed in the Messier household because their source of income had dried up. And so it was off to be an astronomer for Messier, uh, almost certainly a job that was got for him through his brother Hyacinth with the connections that the family had. So he left for Paris uh, to work for de Lille at his private observatory in the Hotel de Cluny. And this is the, the, ho the Lille Hotel de Cluny, this is now a museum, this is it um, that I photographed a couple of years ago. Um, and if you compare it with what it was like in Messier's day, you can see that there's the observatory on the top of the staircase tower. The rest of it remains identical. Now I think it's rather sad. I visited this place twice. There is no mention whatsoever that Messier observed from there. I don't know whether the French have a blue plaque system, but if they do, they've certainly missed out this building. Nothing at all. I always make a point of going into the museum, into the uh, bookshop there, and say, do you have anything about Messier? Normally I am sort of just get a blank look. Who on earth is Messier? You tell them all about it, and they've never heard of him. And I think this is very, very sad, but, uh, but that's, the, that's the case. The, the building was actually the, the sort of town residence of the abbots of the, of the um, Cluny Monastery in Burgundy. It was their sort of summer residence and it was built for that purpose. But it did have, it held many guests and lots of royal guests, um, Louis XII and Mary Tudor apparently there. 52 year old Louis had married, um, had married 18 year old Mary um, and apparently he uh, he passed away in the building, having exerted himself in the bedchamber a bit too much. And I must say, he does actually look a little weary in that, in that painting, doesn't he? <laughs> but what the, what the museum is known for now are these six tapestries. They're known as the Lady and the Unicorn tapestries. And if you've never seen them, it's almost worth a trip to Paris just to see these. They are absolutely fantastic. Um, they represent touch, sight, taste, smell, hearing and desire. They are enormous tapestries, they're sort of, you know, they would, they would fill certainly floor to ceiling and sort of 15 feet wide, absolutely enormous. 15th century Flemish and in wonderful condition. <coughs> so it's worth going to the museum just to see those. Now I know I said that um, there's no mention of the building being used as an astronomer, as um, an observatory. My 1962 rather battered Michelin guide does actually have this entry and it says that the tower was used as an observatory and from it 21 planets were discovered. So don't believe everything you read in the Michelin guide. I don't know what the current version says, I, I'm still using this one. But um, at least it gets a mention for an astronomical point of view, even if they got it wrong. 
So who did Mezier work for? Well, he actually worked for um, Delisle. Uh, he was Mezier's employee. Now, Delisle and his wife, uh, or rather, let's talk a little bit about Delisle first. He, he set up an observatory in Luxembourg Palace. He was employed at the Royal Observatory. He then went to Russia to run a school of astronomy. He was elected a fellow of the Royal Society, a foreign member. He then returned to Paris in 1747, and he built his observatory. And so three years later, he decided he needed an assistant, and Mezier joined him. Now, Delisle was already, him and his wife were already sort of in middle age at this time, and they took in the young Mezier. Uh, they had no children of their own, and were apparently sort of delighted to have someone young <coughs> work or living rather in their household. So Mezier lived with them for many years. He spent about three years learning how to be an astronomer, learning how to use instruments. Now, <coughs> he was he was a very good, a very careful worker, um, a very accurate draftsman, and he was put to use copying maps, no, obviously no photocopies in those days, so he was put to use copying charts and maps, and one of the things he did was to copy an enormous map of the Great Wall of China, which apparently had to be laid out in a rather drafty corridor. Um, and then he, he was encouraged to use the telescopes, and his first real documented, well, his first documented observation was the transit of Mercury in 1753. And then following that, he started looking for comets, which was Delisle's sort of interest. Delisle was a very, very good mathematician. And of course, about this time, people were talking about the return of Comet Halley, and it was predicted to return in 1758, but Delisle's calculations suggested April 1759. So Messier produced a load of charts based on Delisle's calculations. And he was observing on every clear night, and as we all know, he was beaten by this. The comet was discovered by Parrish from, from Germany on, on Christmas night in 1759. Delisle's calculations were incorrect. But really what is very strange about this is that, okay, Mezier had, we now know, had recovered the comet, but de Lille did not believe it. De Lille did not believe that this was Halley's comet. He was convinced his calculations were correct, and he refused to let Mezier publish his results or even tell people about his results, and no announcement was made for three months. By this time, the comet had disappeared at the evening twilight, uh, and when the results were announced, no one believed them. They said they just laughed at him. Um, you know, why hadn't you announced it previously? So, how do we get to a catalogue, a catalogue of objects? Well, in August 1758, Mezier, in his comet sweepings, observed what we now know as, as M1, the Crab Nebula. <coughs> This is an Andre Tosselli image of it, obviously looking a little different to what it looked like through Messier's telescope. But Messier wrote, Nebula contains no star. It is a whitish light, elongated in the shape of a candle's light, discovered while observing the comet of 1758. Observed by Dr. Bebus about 1731, it is reported on the English Star Atlas. So he knew it had already been discovered as soon as he did some investigations about it. But what, I mean, this is, of course, ironic, as we all know, that Mezier is now remembered for this list of objects that he just found annoying. Because every time he came across a fuzzy spot in the sky, and most of them were fuzzy spots to Messier because he had very inferior telescopes. He used, in fact, he used probably about 10 to 20 telescopes. He had enormous range. Um, the reflectors were all obviously speculum mirrors. Um, his favorite speculum telescope was a 20 centimeter um, with about a, a three foot focal length. <coughs> And he also used a refractor, um, about 10 centimetre refractor. Again, I guess, probably giving a, a rather in, inferior image. And so most of his observations, and he always made a note of what he'd see, most of his observations say nebula without star. Some are a little different, but essentially he was seeing fuzzy blobs. And of course he had to look at them for a long time to make sure they weren't moving, so that he knew that they weren't a comet, because they looked very much like a comet. So he thought, well, if I can actually list these objects, then as soon as I come across them, I'll know they're there. I don't have to spend any time sort of wondering what they are. And this is the first five objects that I put in discoveries in inverted commas. M1, August the 28th, 1758. And then we have um, a load of globular clusters. Um, and it's M3 that was the first actual discovery, real discovery by Messier. And from then on, he went on to document all of these objects. Now, some people think that the Messier objects were discovered by Messier. That is certainly not the case. He probably discovered about 37 objects. 
But his colleague, Michan, also discovered 28. And Messier's list was a list of all of the objects that were known at that time, all of these nebulous objects. He wasn't interested in who had discovered them, he just wanted to get them on his chart so he knew that he could ignore them, because what he was really interested in was comets. I mean, um, Jatil and Bode and Yasheto got sort of six each. Some clearly have been known since antiquity, like M44 and M45. Um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, the list gradually got, got built up. You will find that um, Michan took he was another assistant. He came into the observatory after Messier, uh, and many of the later objects, the later ones in Messier's list, were actually discovered by, by Michan, particularly galaxies in, in the Coma region. So the catalogues uh, were published in, in three stages. 1744, he published objects 1 to 45. 1783, 1 to 68. And 1784, 1 to 103. Okay, we're now up to a sort of 110, depending on how you count them. Um, but that's, that's another story. Um, if we look at the first objects, M2, M1 to M45, a lot of people say, why did he include M45? M45, the Pleiades, clearly not a comet, um, easily visible. Um, surely he just put it in there to make the list up to a number 45. I personally don't believe that's the case. M45 is not circumpolar, and if you've got a, a poorish telescope, and you're looking in your scanning along the horizon, I think it would be very easy to see M45 and see this little fuzzy patch and think it was a comet. So I believe that he actually put it in for a very good reason rather than just to make the numbers up. But that's just my idea. If we look at his comet discoveries, he is the first person to make a systematic search for comets with a telescope. And in his life he discovered and observed more comets than anyone had done beforehand. So quite an achievement. These are the comets, these are his own discoveries, and these are ones that he observed that have been discovered by other people. Now, of course, in those days, he often observed something thinking he'd made a discovery only to find out that it had been discovered a few weeks earlier. There was no email in those days for quick response. <clears throat> but nevertheless, uh, these are all his genuine discoveries. But it's also, I think, important to note that he wasn't just a comet discoverer. He also observed lunar eclipses, lunar occultations, solar eclipses, eclipses of Jupiter satellite, Mercury transits. He observed the Venus transit of 1769. He did lots of planetary observing, particularly Saturn. He actually also went to sea and carried out tests on clocks. And Herschel got him to observe Uranus to, to make some measurements so that the orbit could be calculated. So he was a practical astronomer. He liked looking through an eyepiece. He never did a calculation and he never looked at theory or never did any theory. Now whether that means he couldn't he wasn't a theoretician, he was a practical observer, like many of us. I mean, I like looking through a night piece, and I guess he was very similar. I'm not interested in, in doing theoretical calculations. So, he was a practical astronomer, but uh, he made an awful lot of discoveries along the way. Professional recognition came much earlier from other countries than it actually did in France. He was elected to follow the Royal Society of Foreign Member in 1764, but he still hadn't been accepted in France. He was an amateur. He was a, a mere observer. He didn't do any calculations, and I think he was looked down upon, and I think he still is looked down upon in many ways. But the, great, the big breakthrough came in 1769 when he discovered the Great Comet of 1769. Um, as a result of that he was finally admitted to the French Academy of Sciences and this was swiftly followed by membership of nearly all other um, scientific establishments throughout Europe. And of course, as so many people, he then was able to have his portrait painted. This is his portrait being painted by Ancien, a uh, Parisian portrait artist. and. Uh, from then on, it was sort of up and up, really, as far as he was concerned. He said of this picture that um, it's a good likeness, but it makes me look a little younger than I really am. And I guess the object of any artist was to try and uh, make their sitter look a bit better than they thought they did. A brief personal life. Um, Delisle died in 1768. And in 1770, Messier got married. In 1771, he took over de Lille's title as being um, astronomer of the Navy. This meant he was granted a salary of uh, 1,700 francs per year, which was only increased. He moved out of de Lille's apartments, and he actually moved into the uh, 
the Hotel de Cluny, he was in a room next to the observatory. Presumably, if the sky suddenly cleared, he could dash out from his bedroom straight to his telescope. 15th of March 1772, his wife gave birth to a son, but sadly, 11 days later, they both died, and Charles didn't remarry. So what did he do the night that his uh, son died? His wife died first. What did he do the night his son died? He dashed out to his telescope and spent the night um, looking at the sky. This was his way of coping with it, I guess. Now, he suffered a severe accident. In fact, I think it's rather lucky that he survived. He was out walking with his friend Saron. Now, Saron was a member of the French Assembly. Um, he was a very, very clever mathematician, and he did all Messier's orbit calculations. Orbit like discovering comets, Saron like doing the calculations to work out their orbits. And Messier was walking through Parc Monceau, and uh, he opened the, saw this little building with the door, and he opened it, looked inside, and promptly fell 25 feet to the ground, because what he'd done was open the door of an ice cellar. He suffered a broken arm, a broken wrist, a broken thigh, two broken ribs and a badly cut head and he was off work for just over a year. I guess in terminology we've used these days he would become very much a bed broker. Um, his first observation on return was to look at uh, another transit of Mercury. And this is a bit ironic really because the first ever documented observation that he did was a transit of Mercury. Of course, 1789 was not a good time to be uh, anyone in France. It was a very difficult time for Messier, it was a very difficult time for most people. The Navy effectively was shut down, so there was no observatory at Cluny, no funding for the observatory at Cluny. Um, it is said that Messier had to borrow oil for his lamp. Some of the Messier family moved to Germany, I guess, because they thought they may be a bit too aristocratic and wanted to get out of the way. And it was certainly not a good time to be a member of the French aristocracy. Saron was sentenced to death, this is his orbit calculator, was sentenced to death by the Revolutionary Court, and he was guillotined the same day. It is said that on the night before his execution, he calculated the final comet orbit for Messier. Now, I'm not sure what I would do on my last night, but I suspect it wouldn't be calculating a comet orbit. <laughs> This really was the beginning of the end. <clears throat> in 1798, his sister, who'd been looking after him, died. The following year, his younger brother and his niece came to look after him. In 1806, Napoleon gave him the cross of the Legion of Honor. And his last comet observation was the Great Comet of 1807. In fact, I think, actually, in 1801, to discover a comet when you were 71, certainly in those days, is, is no, no bad deal. He was clearly a very, very good observer. By 1808 his eyesight had failed and he could no longer read or write. And in 1812 he had a stroke, he was paralysed on one side, and he died on the 11th of April, 1817. Possibly the 12th of April, we don't know. And three days later he was buried in Père Lachaise. Now, I don't know whether, whether anyone here knows Père Lachaise. It's the largest cemetery in Paris, 44 hectares. It's where all the great and the good are buried. Chopin, Oscar Wilde, Bizet, Moliere, Marie Callis, just to name a few. But perhaps its most famous resident is Jim Morrison of the Doors. I've been to this cemetery two or three times and there always there's a pile of flowers thrown on Jim Morrison's grave. I don't quite know why, uh, but there are. By contrast, Messier has this tiny little grave here. Now it's not this there. This, is, this is his grave with me standing beside it. Uh, there you sit, there. Um, and I don't know whether you can even read this, but on the, on the stone, all it says in faded lettering is Messier Charles. No date, nothing about him whatsoever. Um, which I think is, is incredibly sad. And the grave is not in good condition. It's also quite difficult to find. <coughs> the cemetery has an official list of its residents. Messier is not on that list. Or at least he wasn't when I saw the list a couple of years, a couple of years ago. You can buy a list outside the, the cemetery, um, a commercially available list that actually does have Messier on it, but it's still quite difficult to track him down. In fact, there are many um, reports on the internet of people saying they're trying to find Messier's grave and can't find it. But it is there and I have found it. What about memorials to him? Well, there are a couple in the sky, he has an asteroid named after him, and he's got a couple of lunar craters. He was going to have a constellation. 
Custos Mesium, the Harvest Guardian. But if you look through the list of 88 constellations, you won't find anything associated with Messier, so that never came about. If you go to the Paris Observatory, um, many of the roads around it have got, are named after famous astronomers. Uh, there's a statue of the Verrier outside the Paris Observatory, and there's a Rue Cassini, as you would expect. Um, there is also a Brasserie Cassini, which I can assure you that on a cold January day, the Duc Cassolet washed down with a bottle of red burgundy is very, very good. Michan gets a nice road, even says on it who he was, when he, when he lived, member of the Academy of Sciences. So what does Messier get? A rather tatty little sign on a narrow road beside a prison. Again, one feels that he just hasn't really been accepted still in France. Delombre said at his grave, he did not write a single book nor any treatise, but his observations will for a long time enrich the collection of the Academy. And I guess they've enriched the observing long books of many amateur astronomers. But perhaps we can make amends because 2017, April the 11th or 12th, will be the 200th anniversary of Charles Messier's death. It would be nice to think we could at least have a talk about Messier or perhaps a meeting about him in the Deep Sky section um, to remember this, what I think many amateurs will regard as the most famous of all French astronomers. Thank you very much.